Hello and namaste everyone. Um, I think now uh, we can start. So I am Meeda Sharma. I am the FP2020 Youth Focal Point from Nepal and I run a youth lead organization called Visible Impact here in Nepal. So I'd like to welcome you all to this uh, wonderful discussion that we are gonna have today. It's part of a series, it's the first part of the series, uh, Stay Safe and Stay uh, Uh, stay strong and stay standing. So um, to uh, let you know, all know about this session and what the series is for and um, for introducing about um, IAWG, I would like to invite Katie Meyer from Interagency Working Group on Reproductive Health in Crisis, IAWG. Uh, over to you, Katie. Okay, Thank you, Meta. I'm, I'm going to actually turn it first to Samantha for some logistics if you um, need to know which channel to be on before we get started. Samantha, over to you. Thanks, Katie. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm going to put these instructions in the chat box as well, but just a few things before we get started. So um, you should see a Q&A box where you can submit questions throughout the webinar. So please feel free to add questions in English or in French, speakers will be sharing their video during this call instead of um, any presentations. Um, so to view the, the speaker's videos, look at the video panel on the right-hand side of the screen. You can select the options on the top to either see the speakers in active view, gallery view, um, or gallery view grid. To only view, um, oh, we don't have slides actually, so please ignore that. Um, of course, if you have any technical difficulties, please use the chat box where you can send chats to all attendees or to the meeting hosts. And in the event that you're unable to reach us or need to use email, you can email my colleague Emily at esullivan at familyplanning2020.org. We'll put her email in the chat box. Um, finally, with interpretation, today's um, webinar will be in English, um, but there will be simultaneous interpretation into French. I'll share the instructions um, in for French translation shortly in French, um, but everyone also needs to select an English channel if you're listening in English. So to do so, please look at the bottom of your Zoom screen and locate the globe icon that says interpretation. And please select your preferred language, English or French. If you're choosing French, you can click on mute original audio if you don't wanna hear the English narration in the background. And then finally, if you're on an Android or Apple device, in your meeting controls, you'll tap the three dots then tap language inter interpretation, select your language, and you can toggle mute original audio. And I'm just going to give these instructions very briefly in French before we get started. So this uh, webinar is going to be in French. Uh, sorry, in English with a simultaneous interpretation into French. Avant de commencer le webinaire, chacun doit choisir une option linguistique. Regardez en bas de votre Before écran. Before starting, everyone should pick du globe their terrestre. language. You can select this on the world icon. You can select your preferred language, English or French. If you choose French, you would be able to mute the original audio so you don't hear the original and you only hear the interpretation. Android or Apple, appuyez sur les trois points. You can click on the three dots and then select mute original audio if you like. If you have questions, please type them in the Q&A box. Thank you again for joining us and for your participation. Katie, over to you. Great, thank you. So welcome, as Matt has said, and um, for those of you unaware of IWAG, or the Interagency Working Group for Reproductive Health in Crisis, it is a coalition of more than 20 uh, members um, that make the decision of the group, and then it has over 2,000 individual members from nearly 500 agencies. It is committed to advancing the sexual and reproductive health of people affected by conflict and national disaster. So why are IWAG and FP2020 doing this webinar series. Well, we've been talking to young people, youth organizations, and local organizations, and we want to listen to what you need right now, and that is some operational support. So we've brought in um, different INGOs and local organizations to speak about how they are dealing with staff safety. Our topic today 
um, as well as really um, how you manage different things organizationally with COVID in our very first session. And that ranges from working remote to dealing with um, communications with the donor. So we're going to get to a few of those topics today. And then at the end of this year, the end of this session, um, I'll also be talking about a funding opportunity that's associated with this series. So I'll give it back to Medha so that we can get started with our Q&A. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Katie. And I hope you guys will stay with us till the end to hear more about the funding opportunity because that sounds really exciting. So today we have four wonderful speakers and I'll be introducing them as we come to their question. So first, I would like to introduce you to Saro Imran. Uh, she is the Youth Focal Point for FP2020 for Pakistan. So Saro, um, I want to hear from you your experience with the organization and particularly the challenges that um, COVID-19 has brought. And uh, of course, your personal experience about uh, contracting COVID and then how you survived and you know, overall the challenges that uh, COVID-19 has brought um, to, to your organization and your personal experience. Over to you, Saru. Being part of a youth venue based organization of limited resources and limited capacity to deal with the crisis like pandemic that has impacted the whole world. It was the same thing. And uh, we got some support from the big organizations in terms of providing technical uh, assistance and providing some in how to when COVID-19 uh, being a um, CEO of an organization. Um, are you hearing me? Yes, sir, we can Hello. hear you. Uh, I can hear you, sir, we can. Just to be clear, sorry, if those of you who have, have hit a mute original audio, you should unmute that because the original audio is now English. And so you want to unmute original audio, and then you should be able to hear Saro. Thanks. Go ahead, Saro. Okay. Okay. So I was just telling that uh, being a transgender community-based organization in a country like Pakistan, uh, it was a very challenging experience to deal with the crisis. And while we are providing HIV prevention service delivery to uh, to transgender people and we which you cannot stop despite of the lockdowns because service delivery should not be interrupted that that can impact uh, the trans people in terms of accessing contraceptives and other prevention measures while for the prevention of HIV so our role was doubled during the crisis like we have to provide the HIV prevention services as well as giving a volunteer basis to the community members who are living below the poverty line, the transgender people, for the for the COVID prevention and for um, some local resource mobilizations to donate low hygiene kits as well as foods and nutrition supports uh, to the transgender community because 95% transgender people in Pakistan lost their source of income due to COVID-19 and lockdowns. So um, it was a challenging time, but the was positive is that being a community-based organization, we have sense of belonging among us that we are from the same transgender community and we have a trust level that we are in this too. No matter what, we will face together, we will stand together for our community despite of limited resources and limited capacity. And um, I myself uh, contracted COVID-19 and it was like um, the, it, the situation got more challenging and you have to operate the, being a head of a community-based organization and you have to operate the things um, from home. 
and maintaining your um, uh, health, not only the physical health, but also emotional and psychological health and be the goal of culture that you have to lead the community who is looking forward to you in, the, in this crucial time. And fortunately, COVID-19, and I feel that I, go, I have more responsibilities now to prevent my other community members from this uh, uh, pandemic. So we voluntarily start mobilizing some resources on university level, community level, and providing food and nutrition support as well as hygiene kits and some uh, IEC material in local language to raise awareness among them what is COVID-19, how we can, you can prevent uh, COVID-19. And that was the my personal experience being a person who has experienced COVID-19, being a person who is from the trans being a person who has community-based organization in Pakistan for trans people. So we managed to successfully sustain ourselves in the crisis and maintaining the balance for providing HIV prevention services as well as COVID-19 prevention awareness and helping them as first aid or like a humanitarian relief in terms of uh, providing food and nutrition support especially to work to the HIV positive transgender people because they are on more risk of having uh, uh, to get COVID-19 due to compromised immune system so yeah but I think that you, you it was a challenge as well as a learning experience to because you know, I feel that we can now a uh, more strong community-based organization we, because we have support from this crisis and now the situation is getting better in Pakistan and um, the lockdown the lifted out and uh, things are getting back normal. That uh, the one thing that was very important and very supportive in the whole journey, the sense of belongingness that we have among the transgender people and being truly a community-based organization. Yeah, thank you so much, Saro. And I would like to congratulate you for you know, being able to survive COVID-19, firstly, and for all the you know, achievements that you have been able to gain, even at this uh, time of uncertainty. Um, and as a president of a youth organization, I can resonate to so many of the things you shared because the challenges are very similar. Now, for example, the organization that I run, we are these days very often discussing about the uncertainty of funding and, you know, because we don't know how the pandemic is going to progress and, and how do we communicate this to staff. Um, there are times when you know, our staff is not willing to do um, uh, certain field activities. So it's um, nice that Pakistan has lifted the lockdown, for, but for Nepal, it was a little bit different. So first we had a lockdown and then we, the government lifted it for a few weeks and then the cases started rising rapidly. So now again, we are going back to the, we are in the lockdown uh, model. So there was a lot of confusion for us in, in between whether we should start the resume the organization or not, or you know, how do we um, uh, maintain staff safety and so on. So um, yeah, so to all the audience, I think if you're also facing similar challenges, then I think uh, today's discussion is gonna be really worthwhile. Uh, having said that, I would like to introduce to you our next speaker. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Michael Ibele. He is the uh, Regional Humanitarian Advisor and part of Crisis Team with uh, UNFPA. So Michael, welcome first of all to this uh, series. And um, I would like to begin by asking you, so uh, as you heard from uh, Saru and also my experience that, uh, you know, uh, it's really difficult uh, to communicate to staff about their safety because sometimes um, people are not taking COVID as seriously or there's often misinformation or uh, people do not have access to scientific data. There might be language barriers or um, simply a youth, as a youth organization, young people um, might be overwhelmed with so many information coming up in the social media. 
So, uh, Michael, I would like to hear from you. How do you think uh, youth-led organizations and CBOs should communicate um, with their staff about their uh, COVID-19 updates? Yeah, thank you. And uh, first, let me begin by congratulating Saro and uh, for a job uh, well done, ordering the job very well in the present circumstances. And uh, his speech talks to the challenges faced by organizations. Uh, one, uh, whether people take COVID seriously, but also when COVID begins to affect organizations by individuals getting affected, then that as a big challenge. He talked about not being able to reach to the people who need uh, their services because he was down with COVID. Uh, but in terms of communicating to youth-led organizations or like any other organization, I think at the beginning of, um, at the beginning of the pandemic, when the pandemic was still in some of the areas in Asia, what was important to communicate to people is that what is COVID? What is COVID in terms of disease? How is COVID spread? And what can COVID look like? Because potentially that is where some of the challenges come around because COVID presents like many other diseases that are already present in, um, in the societies. But also it's important for us, I think, to communicate to our staff that people will fall sick with COVID. Some people may not fall sick with COVID, but most importantly that we are not exempt from COVID within, even within the organization. And by speaking by the mode of transmission, our work itself exposes us to risks. Uh, you just had the story of Saro. Uh, most likely he contracted COVID during his interactions with the community. So I think it's important to communicate what is COVID, how is it spread, how, what can it look like because it, COVID can look like many other things. But then most importantly, what is um, critical to communicate, uh, people look at COVID in terms of the numbers. What are the numbers of the new cases? What are the numbers of people dying? And people like to localize this to where they operate from. So we must have access to that information. Uh, the other challenge most of the time will be that people will think that the information is somehow not correct. You have people accusing governments of, uh, of building up uh, figures around COVID. So we must be able to get people access to the official sites for COVID-19 information in terms of the number, the location, and then the sicknesses and the deaths from COVID. The other critical thing is um, people want to look at how far are we going or what, is, what, does, what does the situation look like in terms of moving ahead? You had stories about vaccines being developed. Again, this is information that we must be uh, passing on to our members of staff in terms of what are the scientific approaches going on in terms of control COVID. But most importantly is that the proven preventive measures actually do work and those are at the hands of everybody to practice social distancing, respiratory hygiene, the use of masks, and so forth, and then seeking care for people when, uh, when you fall sick early. So I think uh, if we focus around that, then we will be able to uh, localize COVID and make people actually appreciate that it is a risk to all of us, but most importantly that there are many things we can do to actually prevent COVID. And if we do them rightly, then we can prevent COVID. And should we fall sick with COVID, then there is a big chance that we can actually recover and get back to our work. Uh, the story of Saro speaks. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you so much, Michael, uh, for highlighting on the importance of you know, communicating correctly and passing on the correct information to our staff. And I would like to remind all the attendees that if you have any questions to any of our speakers, you can already start type, typing them in the Q&A box um, so that you know, we will have some time for the Q&As at the end of uh, the panel discussion. So now I'd like to introduce you to Eric Howell. He is uh, the Chief Operating Officer of Save the Children. So Eric, I would like to you know, hear from you because uh, Michael just shared about how it's important to communicate um, correctly with the staff. 
but also how do we uh, you know communicate about safety so um, for example there might have been so many changes in the organization there might be changes in your local travel policies or you know like i shared whether we encourage people to travel because the work demands it or you know think of staff safety in the first place and if there are things that cannot be um, uh, like neglected it has to have travel then how do we you know communicate these things um, to the to the staff so basically how do we communicate about safety to our staff over to you eric great thanks Meta, and thanks for having me on this panel um, i this is an exciting topic and uh, of course very timely um, so in terms of communicating with our staff we've had a few ways of doing this um, we have had regular weekly <clears throat> coronavirus Q&A calls where all staff are invited to participate uh, through a big Zoom meeting. Um, we have on, on staff, we have a very, um, very experienced public health expert who will walk through with people the, um, the latest public health uh, news um, related to COVID. Um, we also have on that call our safety and security officer who will discuss any any issues uh, surrounding safety and security for staff, and we have um, myself on the call who you know talks about any operational issues or um, policy issues that are, that are coming up, and um, so that's 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 one way that we have managed the communications with staff. We've also every week followed up that that um, Q and A session with an email from me um, for anybody who wasn't on the uh, Q&A calls to, and that goes out to all staff to explain to them what has, you know, what the uh, summarizing basically the call and any other um, information that we need to uh, convey to staff. Um, so those are the two main ways that we have done it. <clears throat> We've also, just in terms of some of the things that we have, we instituted as part of uh, COVID, we um, early on decided that uh, we wanted to institute something we're calling pandemic time off, which allows staff who are dealing with um, uh, child care or elderly care or in other ways are unable to work because of the pandemic to take up to two and a half hours a day um, to to uh, and build that time to what we're calling pandemic time off so that they can um, take care of their personal um, lives and, and take care of the things that are important to them. Um, so that they can and 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 still continue working without having to take um, their own leave time, and we've also um, been very uh, out front about letting people have as much flexibility as they need to do their jobs. Uh, a lot of people are working um, a longer total amount of uh, or a longer period in the day, but the same amount of hours in the day. Or some people are working on the weekends instead of during the week, just to allow them to to take care of family and and schooling and, and everything else that has to do with that has to do with their job so anyway those are just some of the things we're doing some of the things that uh, we thought have been helpful for communication to staff thank you so much eric indeed these are all you know kind of uh, no cost uh, interventions and that can definitely be replicated uh, by youth organizations and cbo's as well uh, but again another major challenge that we see in the organization is also about um, the project and the funding. And to speak about that, I would like to request Kunda Ture. Um, Kunda is uh, the care member of Youth Network West Africa and the CEO People and Culture Manager. And Kunta will be speaking in French. Um, but the question that I have for, for her is that, you know, at this time of uncertainty when we do not uh, know like what the funding is gonna look like, so how do we, uh, communicate to the staff about our funding status and our projects. Kunta, over to you. Hello, everyone. I join my colleagues, Michael, Soro. Thank you so much for your presentations and what you said. It's, tr it's true, the arrival of COVID-19 has affected so many organizations. It's not been easy. The policies and from a stamp management standpoint uh, really 
uh, the impact on the capacity of our organization to respond to these challenges. So facing the, the financial uncertainties, first of all, when COVID arrived, the first action we took was to officially inform our funders. We explained the situ situation, situation to So we had to explain to our funders. We also wanted to obtain their agreement, not only for the financing, but also the, the mission of our staff. This was uh, determinative because the funders responded positively. He asked us to adapt ourselves, adapt our activities, and to make a proposal about our activities, the activities that are in fact um, implementable. So when we had received the funders insurance, international funders insurance, then we, we were able to reassure our staff, first of all, that all of their jobs would be maintained. But we also made proposals to, um, concerning how we plan to organize the staff. And then we were going to explain that we were going to put certain staff on leave, um, but also facilitate um, teleworking. So staff had the assurances that they were not going to lose their jobs. And in uh, most of these um, countries and areas are still developing. This was uh, really important and it, this was not a, uh, this is a very stressful time. And this was uh, quite reassuring to them to know that they could keep hold on to their jobs. After having reassured our staff that the, about our different operational changes, then we made some proposals about the activities that we could handle and carry through, carry out. However, we, in order not to um, break or hurt the staff morale, the youth network that was in place um, with, we produced videos for all of the staff, which permitted a sort of interconnection among the different organizations, but also, and personnel but we were able to put, play the, put the focus on COVID, for example. I, for example, um, made a video about hygiene, hygiene, how to wash hands, et cetera, all kinds of, um, you know, necessities during this COVID era. And this was, uh, believe me, there was such an interest in this initiative that was put in place by the care, the youth of care. So the actually the CEO of Care International, Michelle Noon, uh, this was great for the staff morale. And this avoided our focusing only on COVID, COVID and this helped as a motivation also to another motivation for staff was we would have weekly virtual meetings and we'd hear from each person and we want, we uh, shared news of each person's family and that people were doing well and psychologically and morally this really helped people these meetings virtual meetings allowed the staff to know that 
not only is management there for them, but the entire organization from the top down is introduced in, interested in their health and safety and uh, that we were on top of uh, managing this this crisis and it, we this was all to keep the staff morale high and it very it helped enormously Um, thank you so much, Kunta, because, and, and, and congratulations, because your funder was um, very willing to, you know, make the adjustments, but uh, uh, this might not be the case every time, especially for like youth-led organizations, our projects are like one year long, and then we already had seven months of lockdown, so, you know, they, they allow some extensions, but then again, it's sometimes very difficult to adjust uh, uh, programs if they are for a very, very short uh, period of time. Um, but but thank you, Kunta, for sharing your experiences. And uh, maybe, Saru, if you want to add anything about these things that we are discussing right now, whether you, you have been face facing similar kind of challenges or uh, if, if the situation is different for you. Uh, so yeah, when it comes to resources and fundings, I guess like uh, the small organizations and youth-led, the new youth-led organizations and the organizations that are community-based, like trans credit, for example, the marginalized communities, have less access to word resources. Because, um, like, in the case, like, we tried to mobilize some funds, the donors, but they, uh, they send a, a list of documents that they need in, in so they can provide us funding that was not possible with being a uh, like a less community based organization so i think there should be flexibility prices that towards uh, funding a youth organization and small organization because they are working on the grassroots level and the most of the people in crisis are in relation with the grassroots level organizations Yeah, thank you, Sarah, for sharing that. So maybe now I can turn to Eric. So Eric, you just heard from Saro like how COVID-19 is so much stigmatized. But then there's another thing associated that's about you know, staff welfare and especially about the mental health uh, issues that are coming up. Um, and uh, sometimes the staff might not be very um, comfortable to share their concerns or sometimes they are not even able to identify that they are going through certain kind of uh, discomfort so, you know, how do we encourage staff to share um, their concerns um, and keeping them, uh, you know, like understand that them sharing their concern might not affect their performance or evaluation within the organization. So, you know, how do we share, um, how do we encourage um, staff to share the concerns with each other? Sure. Thanks for the question. So I think um, <clears throat> there's a few ways. First, we, it, it starts at the top. Um, we wanted to, we, um, established early on that we wanted to make sure that we had a culture of caring and uh, understanding of our staff's needs. Um, this included the, some of the things that I mentioned before in terms of uh, some of the ben additional benefits that we offered to staff uh, as a result of COVID. But also we have, uh, we, we made sure that people were aware of the uh, mental health um, resources that we have available through uh, a, a provider that we have named Contera, which uh, provides counseling and other uh, support for people who are going through a tough time or who need that kind of support. Um, we also uh, have, I, I've made clear to managers in the company that are in the organization that we want to make sure that there are, that they are um, flexible with their staff and that um, if, and that they should be uh, allowing staff to take uh, whatever time they need to take care of themselves. Um, we also uh, have uh, encouraged people to take time off. Um, a lot of our staff are very dedicated and in the absence of being able to go on vacation to, you know, um, the beach or something because of the COVID restrictions, you know, a lot of people have, have not been taking time off and we've been really encouraging people to make sure that they do take their their regular leave, um, just vacation. I, mean, I myself last week was off um, and my vacation 
consisted primarily of moving from the right side of the couch where I do my work to the left side of the couch where I do my relaxing. Um, so um, it's, but we've, we've been very uh, much wanting to make sure that uh, the staff are, are taking care of themselves. And, and, uh, and so those are some of the things we've been doing for that. Yeah, thank you for sharing about that. Um, so maybe I turn to Michael. So Michael, um, Kunta just shared that uh, there, was, there was time when um, she had to ask the staff to be on leave. Um, but there are also times when, because it's been like seven months since the lockdown, that organizations have to decide to, have, to lay off cert certain staff because of lack of um, funding. And at this time, it's already very difficult for um, staff, you know, because of the COVID and everything. And then when um, you communicate the layoff, it's even more um, challenging. So can you share with us, like, how do you communicate um, the staff about their layoffs? Yeah, uh, th thanks. And uh, you raise a very important uh, uh, question. I think um, overall, we need to be looking uh, to be sharing with our staff uh, socioeconomic impact of COVID, not just on individuals, but on families, on nations, but most importantly on our, our organization. And I think as we moved through the last six months of the pandemic, there are certain things that have been happening. We have been seeing funding streams going down for the organization, but most also we have been seeing that some of the activities, we're not able to conduct some of the activities because of the restrictions in place. And then that means that um, there is no way we can be accountable to our donors uh, for those activities that we have not conducted. Uh, even when we have tried sometimes to uh, repurpose, but also to do those activities in a way that does not infringe on the regulations for COVID-19. So I think when staff have this uh, communi constant communication about the potential directions, um, the programming, funding, and donor relations uh, going within the organization, then it makes it much easier to communicate at the time when you realize you have to send people either on leave or lay off people. So it's about making staff understand that it's really the impact of COVID-19. And again, it's not related to their performance. It's not related to anyone being uh, followed up for victimization or losing their job. So uh, like Eric mentioned, part of the updates we need to give our staff are not just about COVID itself, but the impact of COVID on the organization. Then that way they can be able to be prepared for some of the news, some of the bad news, which inevitably we have to pass on at one time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, indeed, so we have to start communicating and updating our staff from the very beginning so that you know, it doesn't come as a complete shock um, to them. Um, so uh, as a follow-up question to what Eric shared, um, we have a question from the chat box and maybe um, Kunta, you can uh, take this question. So Irene is asking, you know, what are the psychosocial effects observed so far among the staff and attributable to COVID-19? Um, so Kunta, have you seen such kind of, you know, so psychosocial effects among your colleagues? I can answer to that. Can I answer to that question? Can you hear me? Can, uh, I'd like to answer to that question. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I can hear you. Yes, Kunta, we can hear you. So to answer to your question, yes, we've um, seen some consequences on the morale of our personnel, our staff. I'd like to add something to what Saho said about the 
youth-led organizations that lost their financing because they lost the trust um, of their donors. So our organization works with local NGOs that have seen their activity go down due to COVID. Um, so our youth network has uh, suggested to these uh, NGOs to work together. These NGOs are mostly working with young um, boys and girls who left school. And they are also working on uh, women empowerment, youth and women empowerment. They were not able to carry out their usual activities. So we suggested to them to start uh, making masks on the local level with uh, uh, they had several workshops with uh, you know making clothes uh, cutting people's hair and doing such things so we suggested to them to start making some masks because they lost um, some of their activities such as um, doing people's hair they could not do that anymore due to the pandemics So this is why we suggested to change their activity to start making masks for the local community so that they could have a, a new source of income. So we looked for somebody, for a pro professional that could go and train them The people who didn't know how to use a sewing machine, they were just applying the logos on the masks and they were packaging them. And these activities allowed the local NGO to have a new uh, source of financing and to have an um, extra source of income because all of the larger organizations were also cutting their local activities. And in the Mopti region, you can see that for Save the Children, for example, when school started again, there was a high uh, demand of masks. I sent a presentation in which you can see local ma locally made masks um, that were used. Some UN agencies have also ordered masks from us and the income was so large that they didn't even feel um, the, any problem from the COVID crisis. They've also made some soap made of shea butter. It's very popular in Mali, for example. And because everybody was washing hands so many times a day, um, then they were able to sell these shea butter soaps. So this local manufacturing of products was really crucial for the survival of these organizations. Um, thank you so much, Kunta, for sharing with us how, you know, staff who's, uh, who might not have other jobs or have lost their jobs can take alternative um, actions to support COVID and also uh, generate resources. Um, but I'm also wondering, um, you know, about the, those staff who have to work uh, with their laptops or probably they will be working um, from home. So I would like to ask you, Eric, you know, for those staff who have to work from home, you know, um, how do we uh, shift the operations to remote work? Because firstly, it's about staff accountability. How do we ensure that uh, they're actually working, you know? And secondly, about the logistics that comes with it. For example, um, the finance staff need a lot of uh, printers and, you know, scanners. And then, you know, uh, so if they're working from home, that will be really challenging. Uh, some of the staff might not have laptops or like desks for example, or even internet connection, good internet connections. So um, yeah, how, how do we shift our operations to remote work? 
Yes, yeah, so uh, thank you for the question. I think it, it saved the children anyway. All, nearly all of our staff are working remotely at this point. Um, we had previously issued to all of our staff uh, laptop computers, so they were able to take those home uh, when this when we all started working from ho started working from home. Um, and for those staff that needed additional equipment in order to do their job, like printers or scanners, we've just gone ahead and purchased them for them. Um, so for us, that particular question hasn't really been that much of an issue. Um, we've also allowed uh, staff, um, particularly those who work on lots of Excel spreadsheets and stuff who, for whom the small screens of the laptops aren't sufficient, we've allowed them to purchase and we reimbursed for um, monitors, which are you know larger screens for them to be able to do their job. So um, that's really how, how we've approached that. It, it's been remarkable. People have been remarkably resilient um, to the changes in the in the working environment and have and have uh, continued to work. If anything, probably more than what they used to when they were working at, at the office. Um, so we haven't had the issue of um, needing to. You know, check in to make sure people are actually working. That's 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 not really been an issue. We've we've trusted them to work, and they've they've continued to perform. So, yeah, thank you so much. Um, one of the challenge that my organization has been facing is also about bringing staff back to work after such a long time. Um, so when the government decided to lift the lockdown and we decided to start the office because many other organizations were doing that as well. But you know, that doesn't necessarily um, ensure safety because then public transportations were on and the staff were not willing to come to, you know, come through public transportations. And then, um, so they were either, they needed additional travel money or something like that, which is really challenging for a uh, youth led organization like ours. But also the decision itself to make about when to you know, resume office. So uh, Michael, maybe you can help me with that uh, by you know, explaining like how do we transition back to working in the office uh, safely? Yeah, thank you. And uh, the return to office uh, normally comes up uh, with uh, lots of dimensions to, that you'll observe amongst the staff. One, there will be staff definitely who will have anxiety about coming to the office, around, concerns around their safety in the office, concerns about uh, moving away from the new normal that they have been used to. Uh, you know, when people are telecommuting, then you, know, they don't, you don't have to factor in the commuting time to the, to the office, uh, you don't, uh, even you put away even some of your office clothes, uh, clothes and you know, so all that anxiety comes in. But then also, there are staff who are actually looking forward to coming to the office and they will not be actually conscious of the safety concerns. So you will find two types of, uh, uh, two kind of categories among the staff. Those who are really conscious and anxious of almost afraid to come back to the office, but then there are those who are very, who have been waiting to come back to the office and may not really look into uh, the safety measures. But what is important is, um, I think managing, and uh, what I would recommend most would be to return in phases, because the first phase, normally from my experience, it offers a lot of learning. Uh, because you remember when we moved away from the office, uh, the time, the use of masks was, there was still a lot of controversy around the use of masks, around sanitization, around safety issues. So it's always important to get in in small numbers. And once you get in in small numbers, you'll be able to observe some of the obvious um, failures to, uh, to correspond to the measures that you need for prevention. And then you can come up with ways that can practically be used to ensure that people um, come up. Uh, compliant to those measures. Um, the other one, of course, is um, of course you have to look at your staff and then go one by one with them and find out how comfortable they are. Do they have any specific concerns around coming back to the office? You have staff with underlying medical conditions. You may have concerns to come back to the office. You have staff. Um, your staff who may have 
situations at home that are actually pushing them away from home and the office is a kind of a safe space for them where they run away from maybe some of the challenges they have in their homes. So you have to balance all this, but the critical thing, the most important thing is the safety of everybody in the office because you don't want to go back into the office and then after one week you have to close back, you have to close down the office again. And then of course the general mood of the population because remember we are not working in isolation as lockdown levels are relifted, people generally relax. So it's difficult sometimes for people to, to enforce measures within an office when the overall population seems to be relaxing and having a sense of safety. If you get uh, cases where the numbers have gone down, like it's happening in South Africa now, the number of new cases has remarkably dropped and you can see in the community, in the, out in the public, the feeling of safety comes back to people. So that needs to be addressed as people come back to the office. Thank yeah, you. Thank you so, yeah, thank you so much, Michael. And I really liked uh, what you said, that we have more evidence about prevention now uh, than before the lockdown. And that means we should be uh, a little bit more confident about um, coming back to office. Uh, I would like to remind um, uh, all the attendees that if you have any questions, you can put it in the Q&A chat box. Um, and uh, thank you, Jennifer, uh, for your question. So um, Jennifer from Nigeria has this question about, you know, how you work from home uh, when what, uh, uh, what, do you, what do you do when your organization has uh, lots of community level um, activities? Um, and Jennifer, Visible Impact has also shared, uh, faced this problem because we were just about to launch a new project uh, with a community based approach and then the lockdown happened. So um, then, of course, we had to uh, wait for a few months to see if there were lockdown opening any soon. And now we know that it's not happening any soon. So we communicated it with um, our donors and we have shifted most of our community level activities to a uh, digital platform. However, it has its own limitations, but then, you know, we are still hoping that some of the community level activities can be resumed um, in a few months. Uh, so right now, those parts about training or orientation um, and the uh, kickoff kind of activities, we have shifted it to a uh, digital platform. But I think this is a very interesting question. So um, I'd like to hear from any of our speakers um, regarding what are your thoughts on this, like uh, organizations that focus on community level activities versus those who uh, ha have the privilege of working uh, you know, at, from home. Um, so if you have your thoughts about um, what other ideas would come up, I think uh, any, any of you can answer that. Um, can I add something here? Yes, please, please. Yeah, so the biggest challenge um, running a community-based project is that most of our staff is not pro-technology they never used the uh, android apple phones or what is zoom they don't know it and when you are working on service delivery you cannot do it digitally so uh, in any case this was a, this is actually a biggest challenge for the community that are working with staff from the grassroots level as well as providing services to the community and you have provide the services, you cannot stop the services at any cost. And here it's come that being a youth led or community based organization, we don't have reserve funds or extra resources. So we can provide them with the, the technological uh, instruments or phones or something like that. So that when there comes a decision, when you say that, okay, uh, what is important? Money or health? People in Pakistan, the transgender people are living below the poverty line and the field staff is have priority of having resources to feed their family because they, the, then comes the parties and where we decide that we have continued despite of what resources we have and um, the, for, to what maximum prevention we do. And um, the most important thing is that um, despite of the crisis, there was not uh, the, com the flexibility in targets from the donors that you have to fulfill the targets despite of the crisis. 
so yeah this is a challenge that the community based organizations are facing that the, when the things cannot be done digitally yeah thank you sir for highlighting on that if any of our other speakers would like to add to that um yeah, if not, then uh, maybe um, we can discuss about another issue um, that's about, you know, having the policies and uh, guidelines in place. Uh, so, for example, we do not have a separate safety officer or um, separate HR officer in small organizations. So usually a program officer or a one person is doing a lot of um, different kinds of work. Um, but now because uh, there's a shift in the working style, we might be requiring new policies and or it might be very like it's, um, in the form of guidelines but at this time like what are the things that we should definitely not miss out uh, when we are communicating the change in the overall scenario and um, the working style uh, to the staff so um, any staff any speakers um, can can highlight on this part like what are the immediate things that we need to do um, to ensure that we have communicated the change in the policies to our staff Eric, Michael, Kunta, Vinsaro. Yeah, maybe I can I can go first. Yeah, thank you, Michael. Yeah, so in terms of policies, um, and this is not limited just to the youth-led organization or the community organizations. I think COVID caught all of us uh, kind of unaware, and we've had to adapt. Uh, to working in the current uh, context. But um, in all that we are going to develop for organizations, I think the most important thing is safety of the people working within the organizations. And there is plenty of um, already developed policies and guidelines. There are plenty of materials out, out, around, out there on safety. And um, that we should be able to adapt that to our organizations. And uh, I would like to appeal especially for um, organizations or the bigger organizations that are supporting community-led organizations or youth organizations to ensure that they provide that kind of technical support to them. And the other one is, would be you know, how do we ensure that there's continuity of whatever service we're doing? Uh, when Sarah was speaking, he talked about that they did not stop providing services during the lockdowns. So again, there is plenty of guidance out there on how we can continue services in different sectors. And I think uh, what we need to do is to really ensure that these guidances are available to our community-led organizations or the youth organizations and that we can simplify them and localize them to the local context where they operate from so that they don't appear to be very theoretical policies and guidance documents. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Michael. Um, so maybe I, I would like to hear from Kunta as well. You know, uh, we discussed about the challenges of, you know, working remotely and not working remotely. So um, is there any additions that you would like to have about, you know, what if the staff cannot operate remotely or there are no circumstances where we can allow the staff to um, you know, work remotely? Okay. Merci, uh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, concerning telework and working from home, we, we put, uh, it was a challenge for us to put policies in place. A challenge that encompassed several aspects. First of all, this was really a first for the majority of staff. They had never worked uh, remotely before. They were not used to working, uh, not at all used to, to teleworking. But everybody knew how to use the different forms of communication because they were used all the time within the country or are rather with other country offices in the region. So the staff were totally at ease with the technology. 
But working from home, there were personal challenges in the sense that this happened to coincide with the month of March. But most Sahara countries and the different electricity cuts can last for hours and hours or even the whole day long. But when people are working from home, they um, would not have generators at home in order to even have the electricity. So teleconferencing was just not an option for a lot of the time. So we were working on documents together and so the staff, there were staff who didn't even have electricity at home. So to complete what, or uh, add to what Eric was saying, so we could um, help them with uh, giving them some money for communication and better connections. But beyond all of that, since this was, uh, given that this was our the very first time that uh, people had to figure out the um, intersection between family life and professional work at home. Uh, uh, every Monday we would have meetings where we would discuss different challenges that working from home posed. We would share of that. So every, Every, every week with the entire staff, we would discuss these challenges. Sometimes uh, they would follow by telephone and they had to make sure their telephones were charged, assuming that. We also, beyond that, put into place some measures to, to listen, to share each person's feelings. So actually, we put into place a survey where each person um, indicated their personal challenges at home. There was uh, issues of domestic violence or physical sometimes. So we took a, um, a census of all of these different challenges. And so some people began actually coming into the office, but on a rotating basis. So, and we, with all, while all the while respecting social distancing in the office. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Kunta. And uh, thank you for highlighting. Thank you. The... Yeah. So, yeah. Um, Thank you for highlighting on the part of electricity because um, even when we were having this webinar, there was electricity cut in my place and then um, it's just come up. So I don't know if you have noticed that in the video, but that's just an example of how sometimes, you know, you're having a very important meeting and then uh, because of this power cuts, it might not be very easy to um, work from home. Um, so after that, I would like to turn to Eric again because there is a lot of interest about um, the psychosocial effect on the staff. So I was wondering, because you have touched a little bit on that already, but uh, I was wondering um, if, you know, there has been, if you have observed any kind of uh, psychosocial impact on the staff or your colleagues that you know, um, that's been attributable to COVID-19. And if yes, uh, what are the measures that you're taking to ensure that uh, the staff and your colleagues have uh, mental health safety? Sure, <clears throat> sure. Thank you for the, for the question. I, you know, I've, I, th I think we we are observing uh, among some staff some burnout um, just from working so hard for so long. Um, I think when the when the uh, pandemic first struck, and we all started working from home. We sort of had this uh, adrenaline rush, which helped us get through the first you know month, maybe or two of of the pandemic. But then, as things kind of started to settle in, and we we realized that um, this was going to be a long term. Um, you know, a long-term state of affairs. Uh, I think people are starting to you know, burn out a little bit. And so we're, like I mentioned earlier, we're really encouraging people to take advantage of the um, counseling services that we offer uh, through Conterra, our external counseling provider, as well as 
um, making sure that people are taking time off uh, during the day, that they're being flexible, that they're that our managers are being flexible with their with their staff, um, and that we're and that and you know, people are taking vacations when you know whenever they can. So um, that's those are some of the measures that we've been taking, um, and and really you know trying to instill in our organization a a, uh, a culture of caring for our staff. So. Um, unfortunately, you know, it's been hard for me to observe this in person because, of course, we're all working remotely and the best that I can do is observe people on a screen like we have here right now. Um, so, uh, and, and you don't pick up on some of these things in the same way when you're on, online as you would if you were in person. So, um, but nonetheless, those are some of the, some of the things that we're doing. Yeah, thank you in highlighting the importance of having the culture of care. And uh, sometimes like bigger organizations do have the resources to even have a separate psychiatrist or psychological counselor. Um, but even for visible impact, like uh, we have been offering, um, because there are several organizations that are offering free psychosocial um, counseling. And then, you know, we have been trying to link our staff um, to those resources because we do not like have the capacity to have separate um, psychosocial counselor, but it's really great that some of the large organizations are offering, you know, free um, psychosocial counseling. So thank you for highlighting on that. And uh, so I would like to turn to Sarah now because you have a question from Anushka Kalyanpur from CARE. Uh, firstly, she would like to express her sincere thanks to you for your insights and leadership during this challenging time. And her question is that, what key ask would you have for other partner organizations? Because you have talked about the importance of needing greater flexibility from donors. Do you have any other key asks and recommendations for how INGOs and UN organizations can amplify the efforts of youth-led organizations? So over okay. to you, Saro. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for the question. Um, I will continue from the previous question towards this question. Like when we talk about the psychological uh, impacts of the crisis, um, uh, I will share the literally that people think that I have I uh, got COVID nineteen because I am a transgender. These type of stereotypes that we we have faced discrimination and uh, like stigma attached with certain communities and the COVID-19 and uh, we, as you said that we uh, being a community based organization, we don't have enough resources to get the psychological supports, but we as a community make a chain to uh, keep the momentum on and to support each other. And even when I was in isolation, a, a other community member who just uh, get recovered from the COVID-19 was um, like helping me out at how to uh, uh, like take care of yourself in COVID-19 and coming towards that what recommendations I have is that number one there should be the flexibility towards the youth-led small community-based organizations when it comes to resource mobilizations because I have seen that the big organizations who have all the legal documents and things have a lot of funds in their reserves that they can uh, like uh, continue, they can sustain their organization for even two to three years. But being community-based organizations, we cannot even sustain for two to three months by our own self. We need resources to sustain. And uh, I think that there should be the network and coalition building in this time of crisis of all the, like for instance, the community-based organization in South Asia, and we can like develop the recommendations and uh, support each other in terms of technical and mobile resource mobilization uh, as a consortium to, uh, to, uh, to influence the donors to take into consideration the Hi, Saro. Yeah, okay, so there was a little bit of um, cut in between. So yeah, thank you so much for, you know, highlighting uh, the challenges that youth-led organizations and CBOs are still uh, facing. 
And uh, from your experience and from mine as well, you know, it's mostly about uh, connecting with the donors um, and, you know, sharing our concerns and experiences and seeing if there is like space for um, donors to support us. So I think that will bring us to um, yeah. our final, yeah. That will bring us to um, probably the final um, questions I have uh, to all the speakers. So, you know, because uh, you work with UNFPA, Save the Children and Care. So I was wondering, um, you know, responding to Saru's uh, and my concerns as well, how can uh, organizations like yours uh, support organizations like Saru's and mine? So can we start with Michael? Yeah, I uh, thank you. Yes, so one of the one of the ways we have recommended that UNFP that we can support um, such organizations is to have um, flexibility in terms of the requirements for engaging uh, them as implementing partners. Um, so the flexibility is there in, for local organizations in terms of uh, having them come on as as grantees, as opposed to implementing partners where the requirements for them uh, to engage with UNFP would be very, very laborious, as Saro pointed out, they would need uh, plenty of documentation and so forth. So then that allows, um, it allows UNFP to work with uh, such organizations and also support them to develop um, their own capacity in terms of the uh, legal and regulatory requirements that they need to come on as um, as an implementing partner. And we have seen a number of um, smaller community-led organizations grow uh, through that kind of uh, flexibility and support into um, real-time, uh, full-time implementing partners for UNFPM. Uh, the other option also is uh, within emergencies or during crisis like COVID-19, um, we have procedures that allow us to um, to set aside some of the requirements to engage uh, implementing partners. So again, during times like this, we have reached out to some organizations in some countries and we've been able to engage them to have them uh, to have small grants to this organization, then they can engage in some of the activities that we as UNFP would not be able to implement in the current status. For example, if there is a lockdown, it's more likely that a community-led organization is able to continue with some activities as opposed, uh, in a better way than a big organization which has lots of security and uh, restrictive uh, kind of regulations. So that's how we try to work around and see how we can support youth and community-led organizations. Thank you. Um, thank you, Michael. So over to you, Kunta, with the same question, like how can organizations like CARE support organizations like SAROs? Hello, can you hear me, says Kunta. Hello. Can you hear me, says Kunta? Yes. Oui. Ça marche. Ah, OK. D'accord. OK, great. OK. Uh, pour répondre à cette question, je vais uh, compléter... Uh, I'd like to answer to that question by adding uh, to what my colleague has said. It is true that we should be more flexible in terms of procedures that could help uh, move things along. But we have to remember that these procedures were very important to secure funds and also to ensure accountability. Now, beyond that uh, aspect, it is, I think it's crucial to support local organizations. I gave you the example of um, organization that helps support young women. Uh, 
sometimes these organizations are there, but they don't have enough ideas. They don't know how to take the initiative. Sometimes they don't have the courage to go and talk to uh, the big NGOs and to raise issues. This is why larger organizations should also communicate with them. Um, we all go through the same situation throughout the world in every sector. And there are some things that we can do, some activities can be carried out. So we have to know which type of support those local NGOs need. I think that this type of support between NGOs on the local and international level are very important. Internationally, this can also help develop new programs. So I think it would be useful to have a type of permanent contact, uh, contact between the international NGOs and the small NGOs that are community-based. When when the needs are communicated from the ground up, then the investment is more adequate. The investment really um, takes into account the local needs of the NGOs. So we can, um, so we can have a bigger impact and better results. Thank you. Thank you so much, Punta. So uh, I'd like to turn to Eric uh, with the same question, like how can, you know, Save the Children uh, support organizations that are youth-led and community-based? Well, I think we do a lot of that through our grant, um, through our, through our uh, sub-grants on to the, some of the projects that we're working on. Uh, I know that we, you know, we're operating, you know, a couple hundred projects in probably 60 or 70 different countries around the world. And um, we do offer particularly the partners um, who are involved in uh, the same areas where, the, where those projects are, are, uh, are, are aimed at are helping. Um, we, we will engage with local partners to, uh, to, um, to implement those projects. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Eric. And what I hear from all the three of you is that, you know, youth leader organizations or CBOs shouldn't be shy uh, to share their concerns with the donors because I see that even the donors are willing to understand the situation and are willing to, you know, have sort of flexibilities around uh, what we promised in the project in the very beginning. So that's a very big lesson for me. Uh, having said that, we are almost towards the end of uh, this uh, webinar, so I'd like to thank all the four speakers. You have been really wonderful. Uh, there is a lot of learning, and I have taken notes of a few points that I uh, look forward to you know, bringing back to my organizations, and also to all the attendees for being really patient and coming up with really wonderful and important questions. Um, but I think this is just the beginning of the conversation because um, these conversations need to get going. And we are also doing that with other um, sessions in our series. Uh, so if you remember, Katie first said in the beginning that it's a three a series, a three session series. So today was the first part. In the second part, we are going to talk about safety first, operations a second, a close second, um, where we'll be talking about how to continue your organization. Uh, figuring out what activity to continue and or adjust for uh, during COVID. And the third session is going to be about uh, getting ahead. Uh, so this session will help you go through preparation steps, including how to fundraise and communicate with donors and think through actions for the next emergency hazard, such as, you know, there might be second wave of COVID. So keep looking out um, uh, for 
request uh, for FP2020 and IAWG to have updates about uh, these webinars. And also uh, this session has been recorded and it will be shared um, with other materials and notes that have been um, discussed in follow-up communications. Um, so thank you so much. And I really look forward to you know, joining you in the other two sessions as well. Uh, but if you remember in the very beginning, Katie had also shared about a funding opportunity. So now I think it's time that we hear from her what the opportunity is and you know, what the application process looks like. So over to you, Katie. Sava? Thank you so much, Medha, and um, thank you everyone for making this such an engaging conversation. So um, the funding opportunity is on the screen. Um, this is for small one-time grants that IWAG is supporting. And again, that's just the Interagency Working Group for Reproductive Health and Crises. And so we're providing um, $2,500 to $3,000 grants for operational needs. So we're hoping that we can support um, around 15 to 20 organizations with these small grants sad. What? Um, to help you with things like if you need a Zoom license um, to have some meetings online or perhaps as some of the um, concerns raised with Meta and Saro uh, regarding laptops and you know your organization has one person who does many roles and they weren't used to working remote and so you could apply for things like office furniture for them to work remote or additional laptops for um, your staff to work remote. Um, this funding does not cover programmatic needs so we wouldn't want you to be applying for um, sexual and reproductive health commodities, um, but anything that's related to COVID operational needs. So if you do need some personal protective equipment, um, some masks, you could apply for funding for that. Um, and this is limited just to you all, to youth-led organizations and community-based organizations serving young people. And finally, we are prioritizing organizations that um, are serving the most vulnerable adolescents and young people. So if your organization is doing programming, um, serving refugees or displaced persons or people facing humanitarian situations, we will be prioritizing those organizations. In terms of how to apply, um, we will have an online application and we'll be sharing that out with everybody who registered for Series. Um, and just putting in another plug to please register and, um, you know, share this information with your other youth-led organizations and friends. Uh, we have two more exciting se uh, sessions coming up and we hope you'll be able to join. Thanks, Meta. Great. Great. Thank you, Katie. That sounds really uh, exciting. So yeah, with this, we have come to the end and thank you all for attending and we look forward to seeing you again on the next series. Uh, have a good morning, good day, good evening, depending on which part of the world you are. Um, have a good, good rest of the day and bye-bye.